Hello, and welcome to today's Saratech enablement session. My name is Andrea Hall, and I'm the Customer Relationship Manager here at Saratech, and I'll be your host today. Uh, we have a special treat today. So uh, originally, we were going to have Mark Anderson, our Applications Engineer. Um, he was going to be presenting today, but unfortunately, he caught what is seems to be going around the U.S. right now. He's um, really ill. so. Um, luckily, we have some great partners over at SolidCam that we're able to fill in and um, that we're staying on the same subject, thankfully. So we have Ken Merritt, um, and then we also have uh, Greg Abbas, and they will both be presenting today uh, from SolidCam on the science of roughing. Um, so I have another slide here. Just wanted to uh, let you all know that if you have any questions or comments during the session, um, this is an open forum, so make sure that you type in your questions over in the chat field or over in the questions field over to the right, um, and I will, you know, interrupt our presenters or they'll take a look at your questions there and we'll try to answer them on the spot. And if not, we'll be happy to answer any questions after the session. Um, the session will run about 30 minutes. Uh, we always record them and we will send the recording out to you. Um, and uh, we will also post the recording to our Saratech YouTube channel. So make, out, make sure that you check out our uh, past sessions there on our YouTube channel. Uh, we're here twice a month. And uh, we, learn, we meet here just to learn about tips and tricks, um, new and old features that'll help you with your everyday tasks. And here is Ken. I'll let him just talk a little bit about himself. Ken? Well, hi. Thank you. This is Ken Merritt with SolidCam. I'm machining for NX. And um, we'd like to take you today through uh, some very, very powerful functionality that will kind of give you an idea how you can easily um, rough out parts very, very quickly um, and save your tool life as well as save uh, machine functionality uh, for, for you know, the, the quality of your machine. Uh, with me today is Greg Abbas, and he's going to be showing us also some uh, the actual interface inside NX to give you an idea of what it looks like to interact with the iMachining for NX solution. So real quick, I want to go through this. This is some fairly uh, technical stuff. I'm going to try and go through it real fast because uh, it can get kind of long-winded. I'll try to keep that from happening, but this will kind of give you an idea of what iMachining does for you and how we're able to do what we're able to do with it. So let me get this going here. Um, so what we do with iMachining is we take into account three basic setup functions. We have uh, the machine kinematic information, the, the characteristics of your machine, the material properties. We're looking at the, the ultimate tensile sp uh, strength of the material as well as the machinability characteristics. And then we're also looking at several tool characteristics. And we use those to bring them together to give us the ability to give you level one through level eight conservative to very aggressive control over the tool path. And the system actually takes care of figuring out the actual feeds and speeds and cutting angle and all that stuff for you. So you don't have to do that yourself. It can get kind of intense when you do. Now, what we're talking about today is actually the science of cutting angle. And it's a different way of looking at how the tool is engaged into the material. Um, we want to take a look at a little bit non-traditional methodology. Now, one of the first things I like to show is what we're doing when we're cutting metal on a CNC machine is known as plastic deformation, okay? And this is kind of a high-speed video, very, very magnified, but this is a lathe insert that is, is lifting a chip as it goes through typical 1018 cold roll material. And so you can kind of get an idea of what you're looking at here. We're actually more or less chiseling the material away. That's kind of what is actually going on when we do CNC machining. And so um, I want you to keep that in mind as we're talking about the different relationships that we see in this functionality. Now, the cutting edge velocity is very, very important, and it has a relationship with what we call the chip thickness. Now, the chip thickness is actually measured at the cutting angle, not at the 90 degree of the tool like you would with inch per tooth per revolution. 
Okay, we're gonna measure the cutting angle here and we use a variable cutting angle. And so we have to modulate the feed rates to maintain that constant chip thickness. What's really important here is the rotational velocity of the flute and the forward velocity of the tool as it relates to this angle that we're cutting at. When that is done correctly, the forces of the cut are very, very minor. I like to use an illustration of a knife on a tomato. If you take a very sharp knife and just push straight down on a tomato, it'll cut the tomato. It's really more of a chop, but it will cut through it. But if you take that same sharp knife and you drag it very fast across the tomato, it'll slice through the tomato without bending or squishing the tomato at all. And that same illustration is what I want to talk about with the relationship of the cutting edge velocity and the chip thickness. What we have discovered is as the cutting edge velocity goes up, what we call the latent energy of plastic deformation actually goes down. So we reduce the energy necessary to move the metal. It's also very important that we keep the pressure vector on the tool very stable. One of the things about carbide tooling is carbide tooling is very, very hard. It's very durable, but it's really brittle. And so it cannot handle tensile force. It can handle compressive force very well. So if we can keep the pressure vector lined up somewhere near this tangency point, then what this fluid is seeing is true compressive force and it will last a whole lot longer, even though we're much more aggressive to, with it than you would normally think you could be. Now, as we look at traditional tool paths, there's a couple of things that we wanna make you aware of, and, and we'll talk a little bit about how that impacts the tool. But what I like to call the compression zones of a traditional tool path, this is kind of an offset racetrack style path. Every time this tool makes a sharp change in direction, the tool becomes completely enveloped in the material. And at that point, we're in what we know as a slot cutting mode. Okay, now there's several things that are going on when the tool is in slot cutting. Number one, on the left side, as the flute advances towards the front, we have chip thickening. Over here on the right side, as it advances towards the back of the, of the cut, we have chip thinning, which is much, much better. Now on this side over here, one of the things that happens that's really negative is that the force, that pressure vector, if you will, starts out almost directly opposite the direction of travel of the tool. As the tool gets up to, or the flute gets up to the thickest part of the chip, that pressure vector is virtually 90 degrees to its direction of travel. And that's what causes us to have to come back and do a flex cut because we're actually pushing the tool away from the material we're trying to cut. Now, another thing happens over here as well, and that is that the chip is actually being curled up into the direction that the tool is traveling. That creates a situation known as chip compaction. And because of that compaction, we wind up conducting the heat of work back into the tool and back into the material. And so it can have a very negative impact on both the, the integrity of the tool as well as create warpage and things like that in the tool or in the, in the part. We do things a little bit different with eye machining and we'll, we'll kind of dive into that in just a moment. But there's one more thing I want to talk about before we go there that is a negative on the traditional side. And that's what we call pressure vector oscillation. You see right here at the front of the tool as it is traveling through the part, there's an instant in time where the effective rotational velocity as it applies in this equation, the ratio of rotational velocity to forward velocity becomes zero. It's just a moment in time, but it's right when the fluid is crossing the 90 degree quadrant. At that moment, because this effective rotational velocity drops to zero, we still have forward velocity on the tool, so the pressure vector actually flips out here to the outside. Most of you may know that as harmonic vibration, okay? It's one of the major players in harmonic vibration. There are several other things that cause harmonics in a machining environment, but this is one of them that can be very catastrophic because at this point, we're putting pure tensile force on this flute, and it is very common that this causes catastrophic flute failure. So what we wanna do is we wanna limit the cutting angle so that the tool never crosses that 90 degree quadrant. 
And we do that by limiting the angles between 10 degrees and 80 degrees. Now, 80 degrees was kind of a, a great place to be, but why? What it is, we discovered through practical testing that somewhere between 85 and 90 degrees, depending on that ratio of, of you know, rotational velocity to forward velocity, we begin to see an increase in the harmonic vibration, meaning that that pressure vector is starting to sweep to the outside. It never really fully inverts until 90 degrees, but it can start getting bad after about 85. Well, between 80 and 85, we're not really doing a whole lot of work. So we decided to limit it to 80, keep it out of that harmonic vibration area, and keep a nice, smooth, stable cut. Now, a traditional toolpath pattern like we were talking about before is that offset racetrack, right? That creates a number of problems for us. Number one, it limited the depth of cut because think about those pressure vectors on that tool. The deeper you go in axial depth of cut, the linear force on the tool goes up on an order of magnitude. And so you don't get very deep before suddenly you break off the tool. Many of you may be accustomed to running quarter diameter up to a half diameter depth of cut in a traditional pocket. Well, with iMachining, we've actually driven up to five times diameter in depth of cut without any negative effect on the tool. One of the things that was done for years in cam systems was tricoidal milling. And this is basically where they orbit into the corner. It helped a little bit, but it really wasn't the right thing to do. Uh, gave us a little bit more performance, a little bit deeper cut, a little bit faster feed rate, but it really it didn't resolve the problem. So let me show you what we did with iMachining. We created a different tool motion algorithm. This is something we call uh, D-slot tricoidal. Well, let's follow this tool line here. This is the center of the tool, and it actually comes along here. Right at this point here, it actually helixes up and lifts up off the floor slightly. And then we make a fast feed rate G1 move over to here. We helix back down in and we take another cut. Do the same thing, reposition over to here, helix back in, take the next cut. And so you see there are no sharp lines. There's no sharp corner changes. There's nothing in there that would allow us to over engage the tool. So we keep the tool in a very, very smooth and consistent cutting strategy. Now, we, we created this function we call morphing spiral, which allows us to do all this very, very effectively. But it also allow us to, in some cases, when we can, keep the tool in contact instead of repositioning and, and reapproaching. If we can clear the area first, then we could take out the rest of the stock without ever having to leave the cut. Obviously going to be more efficient than having to reposition. Okay. A little bit of a big difference between this toolpath and this toolpath, isn't there? Now, obviously, some people look at this and go, yeah, but this is a lot shorter toolpath in linear length. However, let's talk about a one-inch deep cut with a quarter-inch tool. You've got to take this about 50,000 steps in order to keep from breaking the quarter-inch tool, which means you're going to have to do this 20 times, and you're going to do it at a much, much slower feed rate. In steel, for instance, many people would push a quarter inch tool oh, anywhere around 2200 to 3000 RPM, 18 to 20 inches a minute. At 50,000 depths of cut, doing that times 20 in this area is a whole lot longer tool path than taking this all the way to the floor, full one inch depth of cut, and then carving this out at, for instance, what we're going to show you here in a minute, very, very fast spindle speeds and feed rates. Okay. This gets done a whole lot faster than this does. Now, that morphing spiral can also be a, a two-edged sword if it's done incorrectly. So what we did, if, if we were to take out this whole area here and then have to morph this region here down to a single collapse point here, in order to do that and come to a, a, a common point, I got a short step to take across here and a long step to take across here. So this would be very efficient coming across these because it'd be taken near the maximum angle. But coming across here, it'd be taken very near the minimum cutting angle, not doing a whole lot of work. So we built something into the system to allow it to analyze that area and split it into more symmetric regions using channel separation splits which allows these to remain nearer the maximum cutting angle where the efficiency is very, very high.
So kind of a cool way of looking at it. Now, a typical part, just kind of give you an idea, and I'll walk you through a video here in a second. Um, this part, if we can, we, we're going to start out in the morphing spiral. But if we need to deal with something like islands, then we're going we're gonna to do the channel separation around them. But anytime we can, we're going to return to that morphing spiral because it's more efficient. We'll deal with what we have to deal with, but if we can possibly return to it, we will return to the spiral morph anywhere where it is feasible to do so. Now, at some point, you've just kind of got to finish it with parallel offsets, but remember these are morph spiral cuts, even though they're repositioned, so they're also a longer cut, and the repositioning is done more effectively, so we get a very, very efficient toolpath. We support rest machining, and then also our eye machining eye finish allows us to clear the corners where there could be potential over engagements before running a finish pass so we can get a real nice smooth corner through here even when this radius is very near the same radius as the tool okay now this video and i apologize if the video comes across a little bit jumpy but this gives us a great look at what eye machining can do for you in an old machine Okay, a lot of people think, well, eye machining is only good for super high performance machines. Let me give you a little tale on what, what happened here. This is one of our customers up in Colorado. Cutting this pocket out traditional way, this is on a Haas TM2 tool room open bed mill. This is an old one that they've had for years. They've used it real heavy. It's got a 4,500 RPM spindle. We get about 50 inches a minute out of it before it runs out of the ability to stay up with the cut. So he was doing this with a 3 8 tool. In this machine, he was only able to take 50,000 step the cut. He was taking 65 to 70% step over, but he could only take 50,000 depth, and he was actually running about 2,200 RPM, 18 inches a minute. So this cut right here with a 3 8 tool actually took him two hours, 26 minutes to cut it. This is not a real sexy video. But let me go ahead and ramp it up a little bit here, show you what it's doing, take it up a little bit towards the front side. Notice it's at full depth of cut. We're taking the full one inch depth here. Notice the chip color is coming out really nice. And then as we advance this a little bit further, let's get up here to the point where it pulls out. And notice I'm only at seven minutes and 26 seconds. Even on an extremely low performance machine, very, very fast cycle time comparative to the traditional tool path that this customer was struggling with, okay? Now, what really got his attention was this tool, his way, in this pocket over here. By the time he got the one inch deep, the 50 thousandths on the bottom of this tool was completely worn out, and he'd have to change the tool to do a finish cut in the pocket with a fresh tool, get a nice clean wall. Then he would use that fresh tool to rough the next pocket. So he was basically getting one tool per pocket. Well, we looked at this tool after cutting this pocket and you couldn't even tell it was used. We cut three more pockets on here and you still could barely tell the tool had been used. We didn't go any further than that, but I'm guessing we probably could have got eight to 10 pockets total out of it. But each of those in seven minutes, 26 seconds, instead of two hours, 26 minutes. Okay, very, very powerful cut. Um, sorry, Ken, you put the link to this in the chat box, is that correct? Uh, not this particular video. There's another one that I want to talk about um, that's in there. You know, I'll get to that in just a minute. There's a video in there that I want to go through and show everybody what it does. And I want to talk about a little bit of the, let them see the morphing spiral and the offsets in there. Real quick, if the machine supports it, this is a video that we were running. This is in 1018 coal roll steel. This 12 millimeter tool. This is running at 800 thousandths depth of cut at 50 degrees cutting angle at 14,000 RPM, 512 inches a minute. Okay. And as you can see, save a little time here. I'll run it up to the front. You can see it's going through here really rapidly. And we finish this off. This is a five inch by three inch plate of steel. Remember that's 800 thousandths depth of cut. So we went from full plate to these two shapes in one minute and 27 seconds, okay? The reason we can do this is because of how we're managing that cutting angle. We keep the pressure vector 
to where it's a compressive force on the tool. Therefore, the tool can stand up to a whole lot more than you would ever believe possible. Now, the videos that I'm showing you here, I would not consider production rates. These are videos that I'm testing things in. I'm running tools at the highest peak performance I can run with them. But we can help you understand where to run your tools, where you're going to get much better efficiency and get extended tool life as well. Okay. Now, let me go back to the video she's talking about. There is a video link in the chat box, and you guys can download this and see it on your own machines. This will be a little bit jumpy on here probably because videos don't go across webinar real well. But let me take you through this and show you the different areas that it changes things, and then you guys can watch this video on your own to see it in real time. Now, this, this is a 3 8 inch tool on the outside. And you can see it's carving the outside here, and it's doing a pretty fast job. It's taking material off very quick. Again, this is this is regular steel, mild steel, um, standard 3 8 inch tool. I believe this was a GW Schultz tool that we were using here. Now, let me go ahead and run this forward a little bit, and you can kind of see what it does out here. It runs the outside of this and back here to real-time video, and it, it's clearing off this entire outside shape of this pocket. This is what we call that D-slot tricoidal move that I was telling you about. Now, it runs a finish cut around here, and then the next thing it does, and this is where it gets really interesting, this is a quarter inch tool that I'm gonna use on the inside of this, and I wanna talk a little bit about the different things that the software does for you. Let's go ahead and take that helix all the way down, and I want you to see what it's gonna do. There's a little diode housing island that it has to cut around here, okay? And so it's gonna do that channel separation we were talking about. Now, this is the, the actual cutting speed that it runs at. You can see the dynamic chip ejection. Let me go ahead and walk it all the way around the island. Now, I also want you to watch something that we built into the system when it comes up on this thin wall breach. You're going to see the tool actually slow down a little bit and change the direction of its cut because it knows it's coming up on a breach. And so we've managed that very specially with the software to make sure that we're not going in there and catching on that thin wall and breaking that tool. Now we're in that morphing spiral. Now this is what I want you to see and see the difference in. This is a quarter inch tool at 750 thousandths depth of cut in steel, okay? We're running 12,000 RPM and we're running between 170 and 220 inches a minute at 50 degrees cutting angle. You can see it removes material very, very quickly. It also is very soft on the tool. It's not putting any linear force on the tool. It's only putting rotary torsional force on the tool. So this is pretty cool. Now, the other thing I want you to see is I want you to notice these detour reposition moves that we do in here. We don't have to necessarily go up to the rapid clearance plane. Now, at this point, it ran out of what it could do in the morphing spiral between the minimum and the maximum angle, but it's got more area that it has to clear so it's transitioned automatically into the D-slot trochoidal. Each of those reposition moves is a high feed rate G1 done at just a slight distance above the floor so we're not dragging the tool. But now watch what happens here. As the system brings the region into a ratio that it can do the morphing spiral again within the minimum maximum angle, it'll take off back into the morphing spiral which is very, very effective material removal rate, okay? Again, notice the dynamic ejection of the chips. We're not pushing the chip up into the front of the tool where it's plugged. We're throwing the chips out behind the tool. So we get them out of there more dynamically. We don't put anywhere near as much heat into the tool or into the part. And so you don't have to worry about part warpage. And again, your tools last much longer. Also, you'll notice everything is done in a very smooth movement. So your machine is going to last longer because you're not having to push the acceleration, deceleration of the servos and create those wear points on your ball screws. Okay. So this is going to go through some things. Let me go ahead and advance it. It's kind of doing some of the final roughing, but I want to run it up here to where it picks up. Now, this is an area. And when you, when you listen to this on your own, Computers, I want you to listen really carefully in these areas. Now, these radiuses are 130 thousandths. The tool's a, a 125 radius. So there's only five thousandths difference between the tool and the model. But I left 10 thousandths of stock on this cut. 
So in theory, each of these should be an over engagement and should be chirping. You guys have seen that chatter and chirp in the corners where it leaves the diagonal lines. That's because of the pressure vector pushing the tool away and it bounces back in when it comes out of the cut. When you get a chance to watch this video on your own system, I want you to pay a special attention right here to the sound of this cut and you'll hear it go through all of those super tight corners with absolutely no chirping and leaving just an unbelievably beautiful wall finish on this. Okay. Again, some of the power of iMachining for NX is it gives you the capacity to remove material very, very quickly and it does it in such a way that it saves your tool and saves your machine. And at this point, I'd like to hand it over to Greg and Greg's going to take you into the interface and show you how the user interacts with the system and, and how that goes. So Greg, go ahead and take it away. All right, give me one second here. Okay, so um, briefly I'm gonna go through what iMachining for NX looks inside of NX and kind of relay uh, some of what Ken has described uh, in the system. So um, creating an iMachining for NX operation is very similar to doing any other operation in, in uh, NX itself. We have two types of operations. We have iMachining 3D and iMachining 2D. Um, the best way that I can relay it to current NX users is uh, iMachining 3D is an operation very similar to how Cavity Mill works. It works off of a three-dimensional solid body stock model, and then we generate toolpath off of that. 2D is, is your planar mill type operation where you're going to select a, a chain, and then you're going to drive from the chain in your floor in your top level. So to start off, I'll start off with a 2D operation. Um, you have to go inside the user parameters to get into the iMachining interface. So to start off, first thing you're going to do, um, and once you do this in one operation, it carries on for everything you create after that point. So we're going to come in and we're going to select our machine. You know, we'll say it's a Makino or a Haas, or whatever type of machine you have. You, the library is completely editable, so you can add whatever machines you have. You can modify the, the material database as well. So you can add in material. Uh, as Ken described, we base it off ultimate tensile strength. Uh, I won't go into too much detail of, of the library and stuff just for the sake of time, um, but we're just going to select a plain carbon steel. Um, this is your default machining level, so the, the range that Ken described that was one through eight. Um, this is where you can set the default level for all operations when you create them. So uh, to create an operation uh, in a 2D uh, I machining operation, it's very simple. So all we're looking for is your geometry, so your chain. So I can use the standard dialog. I can come in and select face edges and select my face. Um, select OK. And then we're just looking for your upper and lower levels and your clearance level. These can be inherited if you have them built into your, your MSYS automatically. Um, I like to select them myself. So we'll just say a delta of a half inch. We'll select our upper level and we'll select the depth of the pocket. So uh, at this point, um, I could step out and generate the operation if I wanted to, but I, I'll go through a couple other things. Cutting levels or uh, cutting parameters is where you're going to set how much stock you're going to leave on your walls and floors. Um, there's a lot of other uh, options in here, but the default settings most of the time are, are, are good enough to get going. So it, the, the morphine spiral control, and anytime you're in an iMachining operation, you can hit F1 and pull up the help documents just like you do in any other NX type of operation. Um, so we're gonna go out of here. And then our wizard um, is where you can define your cutting conditions. So uh, your machining level one through eight, so we'll just select five for the middle of the road. Step downs, you, you can do it automatically where we define based off your helix angle. And we uh, try to maintain what we call axial contact points. So we try to maintain at least uh, two points of contact of the flute at any point in time when we're machining. Um, 
So we'll leave that as automatic. And then you can also come in and modify the cutting conditions. If you want to maintain a different max chip thickness, you can come in here and modify this and say, I want to do uh, one thousandths chip thickness instead of one and eight tenths. Uh, if you're machining aluminum, uh, uh, one thing that's interesting, we can actually back figure things. So you can come in and say, uh, required power at the motor. So our current cutting conditions are going to do a half a horsepower cut. If you wanted to, if you're machining aluminum and let's say you want to do a 20 horsepower cut, you can back figure based off that horsepower figure. Um, so, so we'll step out, hit OK, and we're going to generate. And we've got path for a 2D operation. So um, pretty straightforward as far as creating an operation, a 2D operation. And we'll create a 3D operation real quick. So like I said before, we don't have to. Ken, did you have something? Greg, to while you're doing that, tell them a little bit about your computer so they know what kind of performance they're seeing here on the screen. Sure. Uh, it's. I think it's a. It's a newer Pentium, but it's uh, NVIDIA card. I mean, it's a typical spec of what NX would would uh, specify for for their for their computers. Um, you know, it's nothing special. It's a laptop, actually. So, um, and w when we do generation, we also do multi-threading operations whenever uh, we are generating a toolpath. Oh, I'm having a problem. Ken, do you have a couple talking points? I've got a I've got an issue. Yeah, sure. Just as a just a point of timing, why don't you just go ahead and close that out and bring it back in and do the three D. That'd be cool. Okay. Um, okay. But yeah, we well, typically what we want to show you is, you know, it, it doesn't require a huge, you know, desktop, you know, super powerful machine to do these computations. Even some of the 3D uh, super calculations where we're going through um, the the staircase reduction and things like that to set a near net finish, which is what he's going to show you here in just a moment, um, that can be done on a pretty typical computer. I uh, believe most of our guys are running, like, for instance, Dell 5510, you know, the Precision Workstation laptops. Um, they're not super high performance. They're typically, you know, dual core, uh, potentially four core machines, um, 16 gigs of memory, NVIDIA Quadro gra graphics card. Nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. Same kind of stuff you're used to using for NX CAD. Um, and cam so it, it is a very very um efficient system the way it's run the other thing about the 3d and it is very nice it it will also do the automatic stock update so as the system is looking at automatic stock update it knows what has been cut and what is left to be cut and it very effectively manages that so that you don't have to worry about it. You don't necessarily have to create boundary containment. Now you can create boundary containment if you want to, you know, truly isolate an area that it's working. But in a typical mold cavity or mold core like you're seeing here, um, basically you let it do one machining operation and then follow it on with the next one, and it will very easily pick up where the last one left off and only machine that area that is remaining. So, um, now the other thing I can do is I can go ahead and launch it on my side and just show you. Um, yeah, I was I was doing development stuff on 8.5, so I, oh, I might have messed something up. So, if, yeah, if you, if you can pull it up and do a 3D operation on your side, I, I apologize sure. for that. No, no worries about it. Hey, things happen like that. Not not to worry. Um, let me go ahead and take presenter then. And guys, one of the things that's 
kind of cool about this too. Today's technology is really, really forgiving. You know, what you're seeing here with um, the webinar is, is we're in multiple different locations and just able to pass all this back and forth. So we can do tech support for you over the phone. Um, let me go ahead and bring this operation up and show you what he was talking about. This is a 3D operation here. And, and basically what we've done is we set it up to do 3D. One of the things that is very powerful in here is in the cutting parameters, we've told it we want to run a scallop rest calculation and we're giving it 15 thousandths of scallop for it to do that cutting, okay? And so when we go back and we show this toolpath, okay, you can see what what the system is doing here. Now this is kind of cool because it takes that long depth of cut first, removes as much material as it can, and then it begins to walk its way up these sloped surfaces, continuing to rough out the material, but creating a scallop step as it's going. And we know that as we run this in our dynamic simulation, and let's go ahead and let this guy run, um, you can kind of see what it's doing. It takes that rough cut first and then it starts walking its way up the corners. Okay, now the other thing that you'll notice it, it does, and you probably saw it in that video, is it's very, very optimized regionalization. It's going to move the tool around as effectively as possible within the regions that need to be cut. And as you can see, when we get to that finish of the roughing, we're actually in a near net finished condition. In many cases, you don't even have to run a semi-finished toolpath. I've seen a lot of our customers are going straight from an iMachining roughing, which is already reducing their roughing time, but they're completely avoiding their semi-finish, which is saving them all kinds of time, going directly to their finish cut, and we have such a predictable flex unflex of the tool that we can keep it within the constraints of the surface finish requirement. Okay. Ken, so again, I'm we sorry, do, say again? Uh, we do have one, uh, one question from an attendee. Okay. Um, Dave sure. wanted to know, does it work with high feed end mills with a shallow DOC? Absolutely. In fact, um, we've done some fairly interesting stuff. Um, I actually have another video in Duracast cast iron where I'm using a inch and a half three flute high feed mill. Um, we can only take about 60 thousandths depth of cut with that end mill before it gets up towards the triangle corner and it, it actually rolls over on us. And so we tried to do that with that. Now, in that case, the manufacturer's recommended feeds and speeds on that tool were 500 RPM, 80% step over, um, 60 thousandths depth of cut, and 40 inches a minute feed rate. What we ended up with iMachining, now that 80% that step over, remember, puts you on the left side where you've got all those negative physics going on. What we did with that, I actually ran it at 45 degrees cutting angle. So the step over was significantly less than the 80%, but it was still in the range of about a half inch, a little, little above a half inch step over. And we were, we were running it at 4,700 RPM and 600 inches a minute. And it just purred like a kitten. It took the material out so much faster than their traditional way of cutting. The noise on the machine was less than half of what it was their way. The stress on the spindle, the spindle load their way was, was peaking at 95%. The spindle load when I was running in full cut at 600 inches a minute was right in the range of 57%. In the D-slot tricoidal moves where it was taking a little lighter cut, we were down around 37 to 40% uh, percent on the spindle load meter. So yes, if, if you do high feed milling with iMachining, you can, if you increase your feed rates and increase your speed, if your machine has that kind of performance, you can definitely outdo uh, what traditional high feed milling does. I hope that answers the question. Hey, Ken, and if you want to switch back over, I got the INI file replaced, so I, I can do a 3D operation now. 
So, all righty. Sorry about the. No, no worries. No worries. You. you wear multiple have. hats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, when you're doing development. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so 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 I'm back to where I was. I'm going to create a 3D operation now. Um, so it's already got the material selected. It's already got the machine selected. All I need to do now, because we're working from a geometry group that has a part and a stock selected and the geometry view, so I'll have to back back out. Um, but all you all you really need to do is come in. Select, same thing with the 2D operations. Select your clearance, your upper, and your lower level. I'll give my clearance a delta of a half inch so we're up above the part and then generate. So, and there's the operation Ken was showing on his screen. Uh, w one thing to point out also is our scallop machining. When we go full depth and come back up, uh, we actually do a scallop generation based on the features of the part. So as the shape of the part would increase or decrease in its severity, we'll actually add or reduce the number of passes needed for that area to maintain your, your scallop height. So and that's you can come in here and define a scallop, or you can just do your standard depth and not come up and clean those areas out. Um, so it works very good on cavity cavity features or mole line surfaces if you're doing aerospace parts. Um, it, it, it reduces the amount of semi-finishing operations that you need. Most of the time, after an iMachining 3D with the scallop turned on, you can go directly from uh, an iMachining operation into your, your finishing features instead of having to do an intermediary operation. So that's, uh, unless anybody has any questions about the interface, that's kind of the gist of it. There's a lot of other things that we can point out um, if anybody has anything specifically they'd like to see. All righty. Well, at this point, Andrew, I think we'll hand it back over to you. Um, okay, awesome. Great job, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, let me grab the screen back. Okay, awesome. Thank you again. I really appreciate you uh, filling in today <laughs> a little last minute, but um, we are hoping and praying that Mark gets better very soon. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, just to remind you, uh, at Ceratech, we, we offer lots and lots of different things. Um, don't forget that we offer engineering services to address your, your demand for advanced engineering capabilities. And as you saw on the beginning slides, we also offer um, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, Mark Forged HP, and I think we have a few other partners that we're taking on as well. So make sure that you uh, reach out to us if you're interested in seeing anything like that. And again, thank you so much for attending. We do have uh, one more session on NXCAM this month. It's gonna be on um, February 15th. And it is on um, new and efficient production of detailed shop documentation. Um, if you go to saratechinc.com slash events, you will see the link there and make sure that you register. Even if you're not able to attend, we will send the recording to you. So please make sure to register for that. And like I said at the beginning, please check out all of our, um, sorry about that. Um, please check out all of our uh, videos on our YouTube channel. And again, have a wonderful day. Thank you all for attending and we hope to see you on the next session. Thank you all.